Great. Okay. All right. So I think it's just you and me that, that are talking now. We have some other people on the, on the line here that are tuning in. But um, with my group here, the, the swimming group, we do have several triathletes in our group, but uh, we also have a lot of just swimmers uh, that do all kinds of, you know, pool events, open water events, things like that. Um, you obviously have some sort of swimming background and I don't know too much about that, like what you did as an age group swimmer or what your favorite events were in pool swimming and at what point you, you made the transition over from, from swimming into triathlon. So I'd love to get a little background on that. Yeah, so I come from a swimming background. Um, so, you know, in this certain time that, you know, we don't have access to pools or out of the water, it does help me compared to some other athletes, you know, that come from maybe a running background. But for me, um, I was basically born in the water. Me and my brother, we, uh, yeah, I mean, we just got involved with swimming in terms of like, uh, like a safety aspect. Um, because here at the coast in South Africa, you know, we, we in the water a lot, we in the swimming pools, we in the surf. Um, so just having that safety aspect was really important. And it just like kind of grew from there. Like we really enjoyed the swimming. Um, the coaches that we were with uh, told our parents that we're showing a lot of potential. And um, eventually we got to Alistair Hatfield, which is, who's been our coach for you know, the last uh, like 18 years. Wow. My, my brother's retired though, but for me, I mean, he's still coaching me and uh, yeah, I went into competitive swimming uh, throughout my high school days. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I really enjoyed the distance events. So like 1500 meters was my thing, 800 meters, 400, you know, it was like decent enough. And then 400 IM and 200 flower kind of like my races. So I really enjoyed those ones. Um, and then yeah, like I stopped improving as much as I'd like to in the swimming, uh, in the swimming uh, world. And it was about 16 or 17. I mean, I got to, you know, the best in, in South Africa for my age group. Um, one of the best overall in the seniors. Um, but I just didn't see myself getting to the Olympics. And that was the whole goal and dream that I wanted to achieve. So it was about, I was about... 17 18 where i really did a hard transition over to triathlon i always did like the occasional one for fun um just i mean i, I love different events i did some cross country i did some uh the occasional triathlon and i did surf life saving so i was always involved with you know a couple other things and um and then yeah like i got into triathlon but it wasn't all smooth sailing like i had severe injuries for about three years and um, yeah, actually I, I shattered my collarbone, which was actually a blessing in disguise. And that kind of got the ball rolling with fixing out all the little niggles and strength issues in my lower legs. And yeah, and then started like improving and getting better from there. Right on. So um, uh, we talked briefly at the beginning about this uh, shutdown going on, but uh, were you really locked down pretty hard for a while? And was this one of the longest times you've been out of the water? Uh, when this first started or were you still able to find water? Uh, so I'm very fortunate to have a pool in my backyard. So that uh -huh. really does help. <laughs> um, yeah, just tie myself to a tether cord and uh -huh. uh, yeah, just to maintain some sort of feel for the water. Um, unfortunately, like we're going into winter now, so it's uh -huh. getting real cold. Um, so I've got to put on a wetsuit and even with a wetsuit, it's getting a little bit cold. Yeah. So I'm spending about 45 minutes a day just trying to, you know, keep some sort of activation in the muscles, um, keep some sort of feel. Um, like I said, I'm very fortunate to come from a strong swimming background. So hopefully when we do get back into a pool, it won't be such a long transition. It will be hopefully fairly just a couple of weeks or, or maybe a month just to get into the swing of things. Yeah, I'm surprised you even said it's 45 minutes a day, like to kind of hold your maintenance level as a former swimmer with pretty good technique. Uh, it always, it doesn't necessarily take a ton of time i just think it takes the the regular hits of keeping just your your feel for the water and and things like that are yeah, there any um specific things that you were doing in the pool with the tether you know that were outside the box of just regular swimming in place or something like that or or dry land things um so in the pool i mean there's not a lot that you can do 
like it's quite tough actually to try and go for like a longer time, like say five or 10 minutes. Yeah. So what our coach actually did with us is we break it up and we did shorter intervals, but a lot of intervals. And it also makes it a little bit more interesting, I guess. Um, but other than just focusing on like sculling, um, can't really do a lot of drills. I mean, it's, it's hard to even do some fly or fresh yeah. work. So it's just mainly just having that activation of swimming. Do you, um, do you use a snorkel at all? So the breathing's a little easier without the bounce off from the side of the pool? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So a snorkel, it, it really does help because when you're breathing to the side and you're not moving, you haven't created that like bow wave. Right, <laughs> so yeah. Even if you're swimming quite hard and you create like a, a bit of, like some waves and you take a big breath, you might get a mouthful of water. So, right. Um, yep. I learned that the first time and then I thought, use a snorkel. And since then I've just been using a snorkel the whole time, which is yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why I didn't think of it sooner. We've been going to somebody's backyard and swimming with the cable on, and I've just been eating so much. And every once in a while, somebody just coughs and stands up, and they're, you know, just a mess. But yeah, uh, yeah. you put the snorkel on, it's a little better. I've been doing a little bit more sculling with it, too. That's kind of interesting. I, I, got, I had gotten away from doing that because I don't hit the water that often. So you tend to just get in and get your, you know, yardage in. But it's kind of interesting to go back a step and, do things a little bit differently and you have to think outside the box when you're swimming in a little short pool like that because you can't just go for distance and and time is not very well either like I don't know if you're able to but we'll be able to push off from one side and swim a certain number of strokes in an effort and then drift back and just keep alternating between yeah. harder and easier efforts and I, I even put some bricks on the bottom of the pool as like the targets to swim over and hold you know oh yeah so I, I do the same thing. So I've got the Finney swim mirrors on the bottom and I've got about three of them. So uh -huh. I, I use that as well. I look at myself in terms of technique to make sure like I'm pulling right and everything like that. And also like I can see according to where the mirror ends, I can determine like what pace I'm pushing. So there's a specific set that I really enjoy is it's like two and a, it's two and a half minutes, but you, every 30 seconds you increase just a little bit. So I've got like five spots in the pool so uh -huh. I hold for 30 seconds, get harder, harder, harder. And I find that's such a great workout. Um, yeah. so like little things like that. It's, it's awesome. Now back to when things are normal or when they were normal and you were, um, you know, on the circuit and doing the IT racing and the, and the super league racing, most of your swims were fairly short. Uh, but did you have any specific different routines or what, what, what would a workout look like for you? To prepare you for that like um actually maybe we'll take a little break and i'll show a video clip because i don't know if everyone here has seen what goes on in a super league race and how there's different formats for all the different races so the swim distances might change or they come in a different order um you have to swim two or three times and i've noticed you're you don't care if you're at the front in the first swim you're just kind of hanging in there fifth or sixth place it seems like most of the time and then the second round you move up and the third round that's when you seem to really go out for it or everyone else is dying i'm not sure which it is but uh i want to share my screen and let's show a little bit of video because we'll usually do that early on in the in the video here to to get a little excitement going and so this is actually uh this first one i'm going to show is a time trial start and this isn't the first day so uh, it says stage two, so apparently uh, you had a bit of a lead from the first day, so you get a little bit of a head start. But I'll go ahead and hit the play button. And I'm going to turn down the volume on that so you can talk over it and kind of explain what's going on for you. So, yeah, from the – from the well, it's actually the second or third race on the day, so you kind of um, – you race and according to your finish on so there's three stages on a day and that was my my gap that i built up over the first two um stages of the day and then in the last round you get sent off like a pursuit style and that's how this is happening so i've got so i was first with 11 seconds over louis and now we start that last race with that um time gap so it just like mixes it up a little bit makes it more exciting um there's a lot of tactics that can get played as well and yeah i mean like this racing it's um i mean you you can't really burn your biscuits in the beginning you have to really like play your cards at the right time 
and mm -hmm. generally that's towards the end. So I turned my volume down a bit to not have it too loud on the on the screen. I don't know if you're able to turn your mic volume up a little bit or talk just a little louder. But okay. um, if we hear too much of the thing playing, uh, I think YouTube thinks I'm using a proprietary video and sometimes it won't let me use it. So that's why I try to keep the volume down on that. You know, like I if you use a, a song or something like that. But... Um, you know, in a situation like this, you get to have a head start, but you don't necessarily want to be out there alone the whole time. So you got to kind of choose how hard you want to work or if you want to make these guys kind of work, but realize you're going to still be with them part of the race. So you're not necessarily on full gas mode here, right? Yeah, no. So exactly. Um, I've, I was kind of in two minds. Uh, well, I was going to take the swim out, you know, as hard as I could anyway, see what kind of gap I have out of the water. Um, my my guess was that Louis was going to catch up to me and then rather work together with someone on the bike and on the run rather than just going solo because that's quite difficult. So I was going to assess the situation after the swim and I kind of just went for it. I mean, you can't really hold back. You've got to risk it in this kind of racing. Um, uh -huh. There's just no... Um, you, I mean, you, you can't really chance it because the the chance for um, something to go wrong is just uh, it, it, it's too small. Um, the the margins are just too so small. So um, we actually he caught up to me after the first round of the mini triathlon, and then we ended up working together. Um, uh -huh. And that's yeah. And then towards the end, he yeah, it became like quite an iconic finish on YouTube. <laughs> I'm uh, going to pull this back. In. I'm going to uh, fast forward this a bit to your next time into the water here. Um, okay. And uh, uh, on your sighting, do you have a particular rhythm as to how often you sight? And do you do any sight uh, breathing when you do pool sessions? Um, when I'm doing pool sessions, I mean, I've had a lot of experience with surf life saving. So I feel like I don't need to work on the open water as much as I as I need to compared to the other athletes, but in the in the race I, I like to sight every fourth or fifth stroke. Um, not every stroke. It, it's quite you use quite a lot of energy to get your head out the water, and um, every fifth um, even is quite frequent for a lot of swimmers. I mean, you're moving pretty fast and you have a good body position and kick. Uh, a lot of slower swimmers, if they're sighting that frequently, their body position is going too uphill too frequently. So yeah. we have to encourage them to do, breathe uh, or sight a little bit less, more like every 10 strokes if they don't get too crooked. Yeah, so I mean, our courses are, are, are pretty short. Like, I mean, here it's maybe 50, 60 meters to that first boy, maybe 100 meters uh, to that second boy. I think so, I this mean, is where Johnny falls in the water. Or, no, that was a different one. There was, you remember that one where he slipped and fell into the water with the terrible oh, yes. dive and everybody uh, yeah, was making fun was, of him? <laughs> I think it was Singapore, yeah. There's uh, so many things because it's so like technical, this kind of racing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just going back, like this, our courses are really short. So, I mean, you want to really, um, there's two things to weigh up is to be accurate on uh, your distance and your line opposed to, you know, swimming 10 strokes down and then you lift your head and you maybe 10 meters off the boy. That's not really what you want to be doing. So um, this is a 300 meter swim. So looking up a few more times is not going to kill you. But I think in like a 5K or 10K open water swim, that's when you really want to be um, reducing the amount of times that you're looking up because then it's, it's a longer straight that you're swimming. And you, yeah, looking up 10 times is going to be a lot economical for that. I'll sh uh, stop this sharing so I can get you back up there. There we go. All right. Um, uh, let's see. What did, I had a couple other questions for you. Oh, I wanted to ask you some questions about stroke rate. If you um, train specifically at different stroke rates using a tempo trainer or anything, and if you happen to know if there is a difference for you, uh, how much difference your stroke rate is when you're in a wetsuit versus not in a wetsuit? Um, I think in a wet, wet suit, it's slightly quicker, but I don't think there's too much of a difference. I can't really tell. I mean, when I'm in the wet suit, well, if I'm swimming easy in a wet suit, I think the stroke rate is a little bit lower. Yeah. 
I mean, to have a higher turnover with the wetsuit kind of um, restricting your shoulder movement is going to be a lot harder than, um, and also because you're a lot more buoyant in the water, stretching and gliding is actually quite, quite good. And, and yeah, that's to- what we found is, is actually the opposite, you know, is that a much lower stroke rate in a wetsuit and you're actually still traveling faster. And that's an yeah. interesting thing to try to indicate to more novice level athletes, but even at high level, you don't realize sometimes if you just lengthen the stroke and slow down the rate, you're actually traveling faster because of that body position. And then the other thing I notice is if you're really working hard, you're breathing hard, so your chest is expanding more, and you you notice that in the wetsuit if you're really working, whereas if you stay at a little lower intensity, you're not bellowing the chest so much, and therefore it doesn't feel so constricting. Yeah. Again, like you've got to weigh up a diff- like a couple options. I mean, there's that one where you, you can lower the heart rate a little bit with um, slightly easier arm movements, but then if you have a faster turnover, like you get oxygen in a lot a lot more. Um, mm-hmm. So you get it in a bit quicker, essentially. So it's a couple of things to think about when, when you're swimming. Now, uh, do you train with, the, with different rates at all in the pool? And what's kind of your stroke rate range that you train at if you do yeah i use it maybe just a couple of times a week not too often we do like to use um uh a um distance per stroke when we're swimming and and we count our strokes but the tempo trainer it's been pretty good with like long endurance sets when you just want to get into a set rhythm um generally in the beginning so that you can um really find your your um, your cadence and then just kind of stick to that and then also just some sort of race pace sets um, just to, um, you know, what I would maybe look to get to in, in the start of a triathlon or something like that. Just set the stroke rate a little bit faster, maybe to like 80, 90 strokes per, per uh, minute or something. And, and just like practice on, on that stroke rate because sometimes it's a little bit hard to speed up your stroke rate. So that tempo trainer actually helps you to get that timing right. And it's interesting when you turn it back down a little bit, how much easier it feels. If you can swim at 90 strokes a minute, you bring it back to 80 and 80 feels a lot easier and, and, exactly. and more maintainable. You a, yeah, you can play around a little bit with, um, you know, what's the most efficient way for your particular stroke or your particular distance. Um, so you can play around and see what works the best. Like if you're holding a time, try it at different uh, stroke rates and see which one is better for you. Like maybe your heart rate's a little bit high on, a shorter stroke rate or maybe even the, the um, higher stroke rate. So play around with it and, and you find like your best efficient stroke. I, uh, I tried to, t- to get what your rates were, but you know, it's hard because there's in, they're not long sections that they show somebody swimming. They, they move to a different camera, but mm-hmm. on the sections I tried to get, it seemed like you're around 85 strokes a minute, something like that in the, in the 300 uh, would you say that you basically can hold that same rate when you're doing a 1500 in an Olympic distance try, or would you say you, you back that down a little? No, yeah, definitely back it down a little. It's more for like the start of the races. The turnover will be quite high. Um, there's a lot of people around you, you want to either get out of there or um, just you also um, need a little bit more oxygen sometimes because there's a lot of water and sometimes you might get a mouthful of water, so you need to breathe a bit more. But um, definitely towards like after 300 meters, things calm down and, and you settle into a, a longer, more efficient stroke um, just to bring down the heart rate again and in, in like a more cruise mode. And then uh, how do you, uh, how do you uh, visualize how, how much or how little you kick or how much do you change, how much you use your legs in a swim? if at all, does it always stay constant or are you banging them harder at certain places in the swim? Well, in the beginning, it's generally like every, everything all out. Um, but lately I've been focusing on trying to not even kick at all, even in the beginning, because sometimes you can overdo it. And the further away you can be from that red line in the beginning, the better you're going to have the better form you're going to have at the end of a race. So um, generally, I like to try and switch off my legs as much as possible in the swim. If I need to use them, I'll use them. Um, but generally, I just leave them hanging, maybe like a two-beat kick uh, towards maybe like the last 100 meters of a, of a swim. I start to kick, just get the blood flow into the, into the legs so that it's ready for the cycle. 
Yeah, I try to tell uh, athletes I work with that you want to go out as fast as possible, but as, no, as, let me do that again. As easy as possible, but as fast as necessary is, is what you want to do on the way out. It's like, if you can save energy and you don't have to be working hard, don't, as long as you're in contact or in the place you need to be. You don't need to be leading. You just need to be up near the front. And that's something I, I see you tend to do pretty good of like, you're not always leading the swim at the beginning, but you're right there in contention. And then when the time is appropriate, you move up a little bit more. So that's, yeah. that's pretty it's, good it's to about, see. That's about easy speed. I, I like yeah. to call it that. And lately I've been kind of perfecting my start. Um, if I don't have a good start and there's a lot of guys like on my wave, I kind of hold back, let them die. And then I shoot forward after about 200 meters. The other thing I, so I, and then my plan B is if I have a bad start and, or I, I decide to have a bad start and I let the others get like a meter in front of me and then I, I, I use their wave to slingshot it ahead. So there's a couple of ways to start and it, it, it basically all depends how the dive goes and then I have to decide A or B. <laughs> so. uh -huh, uh -huh. Oh, that's cool. That's interesting. Yeah. Now in practice, um, from a swimming background, we often were trained as distance swimmers to you know, not go out too hard or to even pace or to negative split a race. But in, in triathlon and open water, you know, it's a fast start. It's always a pretty fast start. So mm -hmm. how do you train for that in the pool? Are you doing sets without very much warm up, or maybe you do some sort of minimal warm up or your normal kind of routine, but then go into a set where you just really high intensity at the front and then more medium effort in the middle of the set? Uh, I don't do that too much in training. I'm, I'm a big believer in making sure that I'm pretty warm for any set that I'm doing. Uh -huh. But over the years, and I mean, I'm racing between 10 and 15 times in a year. So I get a lot of experience and it's on my, I think my sixth pro year. So, I mean, I've had a, a lot of experience and I think over the last couple of years, I found like a nice um, warm up routine that I, I like doing. And generally, um, I like to do my swim warm up, um, maybe not at the venue, but if I get access to a pool, and that might be an hour or an hour and a half before my race. Okay. And then I finish up with like a run warm up. This is generally um, because I'm pretty thin. Like I don't like to be wet before I start of the race. We out in the in the elements of the weather. So yep. Um, I like to have warm muscles, so I finish off with a run. Um, but I do that swim warm up. It might be an hour, an hour and a half before, and okay. I find that works really well. And the more I do it, the better I get at it. I've had some amazing starts, which you can almost call dry starts, and um, just purely because my muscles are warm. And I've had some starts where I've got out of cold water 15 minutes before the race, and I've had a, a terrible start. So it's. I think it's all about having warm muscles. Yeah, and you use. Um... Uh, cords or anything as a warm up tool at races at all? Oh, yeah. So I've got a like a routine that I do before everything. Like I've got a routine for running, I've got a routine for swimming, and it's the same routine that I do before racing as well. And I've actually got a bit of a setup here with my cords. Awesome. I can show you like some warm up stuff uh, all that right. I, might just be five minutes um, that I do just before swimming. Well, this is swimming specific. So yeah, we'd right. love to see it and anything you can okay. share with us. Because I, I think it's something that uh, good athletes tend to do is they do have their routines that they go through in their in their warm up on a consistent basis. And I don't see lower level athletes with that consistency or really figuring out what gets me to the optimal level to be able to perform well. And it doesn't have to be a super long warm up, but a consistency of doing something and you can kind of tell how your body's feeling and and, and to be ready to do it. Yeah, um, so these are actually the Finis slide uh, dry land trainers. They're pretty new and I've been loving them. It's got I like just a got a set and I don't know how to anchor them in my house yet. Heather, do you have a set of those too? It's a little I, bit I'm ordering them. I just didn't know. You told me how you didn't know how to use them. So I want to learn and then I'll order well, them. Those have two anchor points on the end. So I don't know if you can move your, um, can you move your screen yeah, so we can see, see what you your anchor it? point looks like? Cool. You got it. Oh. <laughs> hey, that's so great. <laughs> 
That's awesome. That's how we do it here. Do it at however it works. <laughs> yeah, like the, 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 the options are endless, basically. Um, I've seen so many things on YouTube, how you can anchor them like above you and below you, and you can do all sorts of exercises, like gym exercises even. Um, like okay. it's in like rowing kind of mo uh, motion. So it's really awesome. Yeah, I'm going to order them today then. <laughs> They Mine still is, have those uh, kinds. <laughs> mine's so, uh, mine's up there, uh, Henry. It's in it's on the pull up bar in the background, but it's just uh, you know the single anchor point kind. So uh, okay, yeah. So I mean, I'm just going to show you some simple stuff. Like you can do it with any band, really. Um, oh. I just like to use these for everything now. Um, yeah. Even for even for what I do now, it it works really well. Um, so what I start off with is just kind of warming up the, the shoulders with some simple shoulder rehab. Um, you may have seen this before, but I, I do 10 reps of everything. And basically you want to lock your shoulder in place and then you just do this movement um, pretty like consistent and controlled. Mm -hmm. And of those, do with the other arm and then you do the opposite way. Lock the shoulder in place, lock your arm. And you don't want to be pulling out further than your shoulder. Um, so you'll do 10 of those. You'll feel, feel a nice burn. Um, and then I like to do some uh, tricep, tricep activations, which is the end of the, the, the pull of the swimming. Um, so just 10 of these, just to activate that. And then to round it up with the shoulder, I go 10 forwards. Mm. Uh, just like this, just to work the front a little bit. And then I like to go into a little bit of a core activation. So I'll grab both just for more resistance. And I like to get like a good sturdy position, bring these cords in front of me. And then I just go about 45 degrees the other way, but keeping your, trying to keep your hips straight and move, using your core to move your body. And I'll do about 10 of those, 10 to the other side. And then I'll go into um, some swimming specific kind of exercises, just to make sure that the swimming muscles are warmed up. And that will be um, five. So I'll do five reps of these, which is the butterfly pull, but isometric. So. I'll go into the catch position, three seconds, go through to the pull position, three seconds, and then I'll finish off through. Um, I'll just do five of these, three seconds into the catch, three seconds into the pull, and then finish off. And then I'll just do 20 reps of just um, like a freestyle motion pull. Mm -hmm. Just not easy, not too bad. And that kind of allows all the muscles in the lats and the arms and the shoulders just to be warm, warm enough when you jump into that water. Um, I think injury prevention is quite a big thing for me. Outstanding. Um, yeah. So I like to, how most of those movements you were doing were not at high speed. They were at slower speed and, and setting the elbow high first and going, or when you're doing internal or external rotation, you weren't just banging the band real fast, but doing it slow and controlled to kind of wake up the muscle and, and not, not either use the momentum of the cord as your helper or to just get out of control. That, that exactly. was really helpful. I think controlling is a, is a biggest thing. You want to feel like a bit of a burn. Um, so you also just want to like determine where to stand. Um, but after a few times, you, you'll get the feel of it. Outstanding. Really helpful. All right. Yeah. Well, um, I, think, uh, I think I was going to... We're into a half an hour in, so we can start uh, seeing if there's a couple questions out there. My wife is on the call, and she she did have a question for you about uh, about uh, relays, I believe. So I'll, I'll let her ask her her relay question for you. Okay. Hi. Um, Hi. We love watching you on all all the circuit. So thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, I was just curious your thoughts on the new um, mixed relay format for the Olympics for triathlon. Um, I know we're really excited to watch it, and I was just uh, curious about your perspective as an athlete. Yeah, um, the relay, it, it's really, really fun and interesting. Um, it's, it's, 
I think the, uh, most of the athletes do like it because it, it brings another medal hope to the Olympics. And I won't lie, it is pretty exciting. Like I've been in quite a few of the relays and it's, it's just like the race is always changing because um, you're tagging over to another athlete who has maybe, is maybe a little bit weaker or stronger than the next athlete that gets tagged over. So the race is constantly changing and, and you can't predict the outcome until the last few seconds or um, the end of the race. So I personally like it. It's a favorite for me and it's a nice touch um, to get like a, another race when you're competing in a particular event, because once you get over your, your main race, then like a lot of the nerves and a lot of things are settled and, and then you can really like enjoy yourself. And that's really where you enjoy yourself in like a team spirit race. And I think that's, that's really awesome with a lot of the nations. Does, um, does, uh, did they, I, I didn't know if they've announced the spots or if they had for the Olympics or how many teams have made it in or anything. Was South Africa already qualified or were you still in the process of getting your team in? Yeah, we, we're still busy qualifying, but um, we don't have the strongest of teams. Like we have two strong males, but yeah, our, we, our women are um, not really up there at the moment. So we, our team does lack a little bit. Um, so in terms of qualification, I think we're pretty much out of it. Um, I don't see us competing unless there's some sort of uh, like there is, there was supposed to be one more race. If you come uh, in the top three with your relay, you get an automatic slot. So that was like our last kind of hope. Um, but obviously with no racing happening this year, we hopefully there's a chance next year that or later in the year, but hopefully there's a chance that we still get a, to get our team in, in, in there. Do you know of any uh, up and coming females that you guys have, or do you have any training over here in the States that are uh, uh, from South Africa females? Um, we, there, there are a couple of juniors, but I think they might still be a bit young. Uh -huh. uh, we, I mean, we, we constantly looking for someone to come through, but the depth here in South Africa is not too, too deep. So, I mean, we do struggle with a lot of, um, you know, ITU triathletes coming through. A lot of them generally go onto the longer distance triathlon instead of getting involved in the shorter Olympic distance. Um, but currently, like, we're setting up um, a bit of, like, uh, like, closing the gap here in South Africa because we don't have a lot of funding for these juniors to get overseas, get this experience, and, um, you know, know what it's like to be on that kind of stage. So we kind of like, we're going to set up these camps to educate these juniors, what it's like, what it takes. And hopefully we get them to a level um, to compete on the world circuit. Are, um, are the relays, I, I don't know the exact order at all the different races you go to, but are the relays always after you've done your individual races or sometimes does the relay come ahead of your individual race? Generally it's afterwards. We've had one, one race where it was about four days before the event, um, purely for logistical reasons, I think, but it didn't really work out that well. But generally the Olympics is set for, I think it's two or three days after the event. It's normally two days. Sometimes we have it the day afterwards. Um, but if you want to have like your best team, it's, it's ideal to have it about two days after just to give the body time to recover. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, I know you're kind of used to racing multi-days with uh, Super League, but I would imagine you also have to be concerned of if you're throwing down too much effort on a relay that might not go anywhere, that you still have individual stuff to do if it's after. But uh, I figured yeah. they usually put it after, so it wouldn't really matter so much. Anyone else on the call have a question for Henry before we cut him free? At least you didn't have to get up too early. Our last guest was kind of upset that he didn't get to sleep in as much. I don't know oh, sure. if you know Milo Kavik at all, but, you know, he's, he's the opposite end of the spectrum from you in that he's a sprinter, uh, uh -huh. not used to the distance yards. He's always looking for the cutout. I remember him as an age group swimmer, but uh, he was crying about the 6.30 start here. But it's like, uh, what, four in the afternoon for you right now? Yeah, it's about 4 p.m., so it's yeah. all easy. For me. And you're not allowed to be out training anyways right now, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I actually just had a swim in the pool. I, I used the time to swim like midday because it's so cold. Um, yeah. But yeah, I generally get my swim or bike in the morning. Um, 
and then yeah, some during the day. All right. Well, thanks so much for being our guest on the show and uh and uh educating some of our swimmers more on what goes on in in short distance triathlon. And we really love seeing those those exercises with the bands. It's good to, you know, I try to demonstrate on the soup cans, cords, and core workout that we do, but uh, I'm trying to demonstrate how to do things correctly so that they can learn. But when I watch videos of some of our athletes with the cords in their hands, it's just mayhem, you know? So that was good to see. And and I, I need to remind them that we got to slow things down sometimes and get that burn a little bit more, but go through the motion correctly. Because it, it is different. You don't have to be going at the same rate or tempo when you're using cords or something as you are in, in your real swimming. Yeah, I think like there, there's specific sets for everything, but um, for warm up generally, it's, it's about more controlling things. Um, but yeah, Michael, thanks for having me on this. Really appreciate chatting to you guys. Um, I, I had a look at one of your workouts and I don't think I would be able to finish them. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it took but, a little time to get, we have to put down the cans sometimes, but yeah, yeah. you know, it's so, like, you gave an example, uh, I think ITU put up a video of you doing some different um, cable exercises and stuff, which is why I was interested in bringing you on. But, you know, it's just a little demo here and there and people will watch it, but they're not going to get up and actually do a whole routine. So I just felt that like, if I'm here doing it for a full 20 to 30 minutes, I can get people into doing it and running it as a swim set, you know, of 10 100s or 200 plus 100 or whatever the pattern is. I've been able to get people to stay in and do it longer, which I, I think is a good thing. No, I do definitely. have one more thing that I wanted to bring up that I saw uh, that you did. Uh, you did like some little mini cooking show or something, and you did a, a salmon dish or something like that. And that was, uh, it looked really good. I showed it to my wife. I said, that looks amazing. So how yeah. much cooking do you do? Do you cook very often or that was just a random thing? No, I, I'm, I'm fortunate to have a very um nice wife who cooks me lovely food and dinner and lunch and everything um so i she gave me the recipe and i had to do it and i had some help from a chef but okay i, I, I surprised myself i mean I, it was a fairly simple dish that i like to do uh -huh. and uh, yeah i mean i had the whole kitchen to do it so no, no it looks spectacular it looks so good when i was showing my wife that i'm like damn if he cooks that like gourmet style all the time that's impressive because like the plate presentation and everything was like epic so but you know you a lot of smoke and mirrors in uh in videos and tv sometimes so <laughs> yeah definitely i mean but i, I did cook that all myself I'll, I'll give myself that credit but i got some help from like the chef from the restaurant um so i mean it was nice to get his input from it um just like how i demonstrate these cord cord stuff to you like he showed me how to cook some real salmon and like how to cook the onion and the garlic so like i took that home with me and uh it works pretty cool oh great great yeah all right well thanks again for coming on to the show and we'll be cheering for you throughout the next season and i hope everything works out for you in uh in japan that that gets pulled off in tokyo what's your thoughts on that particular course uh, do you think it's a strength or a weakness for you or it, it doesn't matter um, it doesn't matter. The course is very similar to other races that I do race. Uh, the big thing that will come into play is the, the heat factor. It will be hot and humid. Uh, for me, that's an advantage, I think. Uh, I generally race quite well in hot conditions and with a small kind of body frame that generally you're a little bit more efficient in the heat. So, But it's all about just adapting to the heat at the right times before the race. Um, uh, there's a lot of things to get like timing wise um, in terms of preparing for that race. So it's all about just making sure you hit all those targets. And if I'm able to do that, then yeah, I mean, a medal is on the cards. Right on. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our uh, Technique Tuesday with Henry Skuman. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you over here for a race sometime. Thanks for joining. All right. Yeah, all thanks right, bye, everybody. Cheers. Bye.